The famous Men in Black series, sponsored by St. Elias Church of Diamond Springs, California, held its latest missionary event in the Golden Hills of El Dorado County. The event speaker was Steve Cristoforo, Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministries and the Office of Camping Ministries of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Steve Cristoforo is perhaps best known for his weekly video series, Be the Bee. During this Men in Black event, Steve answers the question, why I say yes to Christ when it is easier to say no. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'll stand up here. Christ is in our midst. Thanks for having me. Um, forgive me, I'm not uh, checking texts. I have just kind of an outline in my, uh, in my phone here. So if I look down at here, I'm not, I'm not checked out of my own talk, so don't worry. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, so it's good to be here. Um, and it's nice to just have an opportunity um, to think about faith. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I, I really love my job and I treasure it because I get to travel around and I get to do uh, retreats with kids and now retreats also with young adults and parents and youth workers. And it's great to be able to sort of break sometimes from the retreat setting and just kind of have more of a casual conversation, which is kind of what I hope this is going to be. You know, I, I try to hold myself to four or five minutes to videos. So I'm going to try to hold myself to around 15 minutes here, uh, give or take, as we just think a little bit about belief. Um, which is a hard thing, right? I mean, b belief is hard. It's a hard thing to cultivate. And it seems like it's getting harder all the time. Um, you know, a, a lot of us might have seen some of the Pew numbers that came out uh, recently, for instance, talking about how, you know, there's less retention amongst a lot of uh, Christian traditions over time, yada, yada, right? Which, again, not to talk about those specifically, um, but to just think about the, some of the challenges that, that we face when it comes to questions of belief. Here's my sort of understanding of it. Um, the challenge that we face and the opportunity that we face, and maybe this is something that we can explore a little bit here today, is that over time, there's less sort of cultural pressure or um, cultural inertia that leads us into the church that leads us to be people of faith. You know, For a long time, you could say that to be a respectable person meant to be kind of a public Christian, right? You weren't respectable in your community if you weren't there on church every, every Sunday, in the front row, well-dressed, whatever it might be. A, a lot of those positives that the church benefited from for a long time are not there anymore. Uh, you're not really being pushed by society in the same sort of way. So belief now becomes something that we have to wrestle with internally, which is in, on one level a great thing, though, because hopefully this, this is an, our opportunity to clarify belief in a way that we really haven't before. You know, the, if, you, if you think about it for, for a long time, since Constantine the Great even, right, back in the, in the fourth century, um, some of the, there's been a lot of like, it's, it's been easier to be a Christian than it was in the past. Not to say that we're being persecuted, obviously, certainly not in this country anyway. Real persecution is happening elsewhere. But we don't have the same sort of cultural benefit, I guess, from being Christians. So that's kind of a little bit of a background matter. So I want to think about like, why do we say, yes to Christ? Why is it important to say yes to Christ? How do we struggle with and kind of think about some of these questions of belief? So I, I want to get to three reasons that I have anyway, three things in my particular faith journey that have led me here, that have led me here to be standing in front of you talking about my faith, talking about my attempt to be a Christian on a daily basis. Um, but before that, I think maybe I want to make a few points just kind of laying the, found work, the groundwork for how I think about some of these questions of faith and belief. Um, so the, the first point that I want to bring up is uh, it's important to think about, not well, to, say, to say that differently, we're not simply thinking about an idea, right? A lot of times when we talk about faith in the public sphere, it becomes kind of a debate. Uh, it becomes sort of a yes, no, pro, con, like we're, we're debating an ideology or we're debating a belief or we're debating an idea. But I think something that we need to be clear about, especially as people of faith, is that God is not an idea. Uh, faith is not an abstract concept. It's ultimately about a relationship with a person, right? I mean, and again, from the Christian perspective in particular, with a triune community of people, right? The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, when we talk about faith, we're not trying to convince others as such. I think it's, it makes more sense for us to think about 
these dialogues that we have as introducing people to the Lord that we worship. Right? Not in a combative sort of sense, not in a I want to prove you wrong sort of sense, but like this is someone that I love, this is someone that I have a relationship with, and I'm simply introducing my Lord to you. Not an idea, but a person. And I think if we, if we start thinking about that, that really changes a lot of this conversation because belief can be combative, belief can make people sort of awkward, belief can uh, really put people off because of the way that we talk about it. Um, but if we say this is simply some, somebody that I love, somebody that I love that I'm trying to introduce you to as well, I think that changes the dynamic of the interaction. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as a, as a, as a background matter. You know, it's a personal relationship rather than an, an antagonistic debate. It's, uh, it's, it's, and again, it's conversation and introduction rather than dialectic, if we want to think about it that way. So that's number one. Number two, there's an inherent freedom that, that frames all of this. And that's kind of there. And th there's a, a really wonderful Orthodox theologian, a Metropolitan, who says, uh, he talks about the ascension of the Lord, right, 40 days after the resurrection. And he says one of the interesting things or consequences of the ascension is that so Christ kind of does his thing and then he leaves. He, he comes back from the dead and then there he is like the physical proof of the resurrection and he leaves, he withdraws. He's not there in people's face. He's not sort of this walking proof. Um, because it's hard to say no to the risen Lord when you see him walking around with like the holes in his hands, right? And the hole in his side. But there's, there's sort of a, a humble deference is kind of one of the consequences of the ascension. There's a, that it's not, there's not a question of proof. It's not a question of being coerced or sort of forced into belief in this thing. But, but God in his humility, which is an amazing thing to think about, sort of withdraws and allows us to struggle with this thing on a very kind of deep sort of level. So 40 days after the resurrection, he leaves and he takes a step back. And it's not really about the wonders and it's not really about sort of beating us over the head and forcing us or coercing us to believe. It's a, it's a very kind of interesting dynamic, the space of freedom that God allows for us. And that's really, really what allows us, I feel like, to develop our faith. And it's what allows us to have doubts and it's what allows us to have this conversation in the first place. It's not simple. It's a tension, in a sense. Faith is something that we need to work on. Faith is something that we need to share. Faith is something that we need to develop. And it really happens in that space of freedom that God allows us. It's not a binary, in other words. There really are shades of gray, and there's development, and there's positive development and negative development, and there's struggles in our own faith that happens in this kind of scary, no-holds-barred space of freedom in which we're allowed to kind of like figure these things out, in a sense. Faith doesn't preclude doubt. I think is the other thing to keep in mind. Um, we, we, we try to share our faith with people. We try, try, try to talk about fe uh, our faith with people. But it's not a binary, right? It's not like you are a faithful person or you're not a faithful person. Like you have full, you're full of doubt and you have no doubts. Doubt is something that faithful people struggle with all the time. And we kind of need to acknowledge that. Uh, we're not dwelling or we're not sort of like comfortable, grounded in a 100% certainty all the time. Everybody struggles. Um, you know, the, the monastery that was, uh, that was consecrated today is dedicated to St. Silouan, right? And St. Silouan, who's an amazing Russian saint, a monk on Mount Athos, a 20th century, century contemporary saint, like even his life, this, this amazing saint of the church, is full of doubts and struggles. And it's full of him attempting to get closer to God and feeling as if God is withdrawing away from him. It's feelings of isolation and feeling of doubt. I mean, this is a man who went to the monastery from the time that he was young, stayed there for the rest of his life in intense ascetic struggle, but he had his doubts and he had his, he had his demons in a very literal sense of the word that he had to combat, which all of us do too on some level. Like, none of us is debating. None of us is arguing from an over sense of certainty. We're all pilgrims. We're all struggling with our own doubts. Um, and it's a way that we can sort of acknowledge that tension, acknowledge our weakness, rely on e each other in our moments of weakness, be honest about our weakness and our doubts, and have like an honest, frank conversation about where we are in our relationship with God, where it needs to improve, and how we can share that and grow in our relationship in God with other people. 
You know, we're not, we're not coming at it from, I need to tell you what is right. I think it's more appropriate for us to think about, well, we're all pilgrims on our way, but none of us are there yet. So a, a final uh, point that I think is good for us to keep in mind is um, faith can't really be proven. You know, faith is not a mathematical proof. Faith is not a, uh, it's not a, it's not a philosophy, right? I don't think we can sort of logically deduce faith and come up to some sort of knockdown reason that this is how, like, God exists. But faith does have signs and indications to which we can point. And I think that's important, too. Like, on the one hand, I don't think it's helpful for us to think about faith in an overly mathematical, logical proof sense. But it's also not helpful for us to think about faith in an overly blind faith sort of sense either. Because when people encountered Christ, like the invitation was to come and see. Come and see. Which is hopefully our invitation to other people as well. Come and see. Not sit down while I logically deduce this for you, but come and experience. Come and meet the Lord. There are things we should be able to point to. They may be, con they may be um, convincing for some. They may not. There are signs and wonders, there are experiences, whatever it might be. We share them. And if that is something that is going to nourish other people where they are in their journey, thank God for it. Some are not going to respond because they have that freedom as well. It's attention, it's the dynamic in which we live, it's the path that we're all walking on, right? So I think, I think that, that, that level of humility and that level of, uh, I don't know, that, that tension needs to be kept in mind. But again, it's not blind faith. And I think that's important too. Uh, there should be something that we can hang our hat on. And if not, I don't know. It needs to be a relationship. It needs, it need, there needs to be something there. There needs to be a there there, in a sense, that we can point to and share with other people. So those are just some background thoughts that I think um, are important to keep in mind when we think about faith and to hopefully do more than just think about faith. But anyway, I digress. Now I'll get into kind of like the three basic points that, for me anyway, in my particular faith journey, have brought me here. And kind of three reasons, or three pushes, perhaps, that have, that have led me to take my faith as seriously as I try to, anyway. Um, first is, to be blunt, pain. To be blunt, pain. Uh, this is, I guess, where maybe it, it's helpful for me to talk a little bit about my journey and how I got here. Um, when I was younger, uh, when I was about 10 years old, I think it was, I began first having thoughts about like what priests do, what monks do, what seminary is, and I felt what you may call a calling when I was very young. But I put that aside, and I had a, when I got to 13, uh, I decided that one day I'd grow up and be president of the United States and save the world, and so you know, to heck with, to heck with seminary and the priesthood and, and, and serving in the church. I would do things in a different sort of way. It was a young man's ego sort of game, whatever. Um, so I drifted. And by the time I got to college, and I finally had the freedom, right, to not have my mom wake me up on Sunday morning to go to church, church became a once every other week thing, it became a once in a month thing, it became a Christmas and Easter thing. Junior year of college, my dad passed away. Worst thing that's ever happened to me, even to this day, worst thing that's ever happened to me. Something that still kind of affects who I am. It's, a, it's an open wound that never really closes to lose somebody that you care about that much. It really brought me to my knees. And it, it, it just, it, it, it crushed me and humbled me in a really kind of profound sort of way. Um, but a, but a, a positive consequence of all of that is that for the first time in years, I prayed. But real prayer though, not the sort of prayer that I was doing in high school as I was gradually losing my actual faith not just opening up a prayer book and kind of reading, but actually beseeching God for the sake of my dad's salvation. You know, like every day with tears in my eyes, just like, Lord, just take care of my dad. Like, I hope he's okay. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he is right now. Just take care of him. And that was this incredible spark and change in my life because for the first time in my life, God became real. Like God became a person that I was talking to rather than an idea that I learned about in Sunday school class or rather than somebody that I read about in a book. And that was really like formative and really changed the course of my life, honestly, at that point because 
um, I still struggle with my faith and I still struggle with doubts, obviously, like we all do, but um, God has been a person since then. And God has not been a concept um, since I took the time to start talking to him. And it's, it's really a shame that it took that experience of pain for me to start talking to him again. But, you know, that's, that's how it turned out uh, at the end of the day. Uh, that experience of pain was really formative for me. And I think experiences of pain are really kind of like formative in our life in Christ. Um, because we live in this weird tension. Like, you know, you go back and you look at the scripture and you read Genesis and you look at the beginning that God made the heavens and the earth and it's all good, right? He makes everything and he calls it good. He gives us this good gift, this wonderful series of good gifts. And yet they all go away. No matter how much you love the people who are around you, like, look to your left, look to your right, we're all going to die. <laughs> Sorry to be morbid, right? Any beautiful tree that you see in the forest will eventually fall down and decay. Any plate of food, no matter how gourmet and delicious it might be, is eventually going to rot. You know, the sun will eventually burn out. Um, all of these good things end. And th that offends, I feel like, uh, that offends a deep sensibility that we have. We kind of know better. Um, there's a deep sense of injustice that that lack really call, calls out in us. Um, because it shouldn't be that way. Because I think we, you know, the way that I look at, look at it anyway is like you read those lines in Genesis, and yeah, it is good. The mountains are good. The sun is good. The people around us are good. Um, a lesson that I learned in kindergarten is that take backs are really bad. Why are there take backs when it comes to all of these good things that God has given us? Um, because that's not the point, right? The point is not for him to give these good gifts for them to end. He, he gives us creation so that it could be his kingdom. He gives us creation so that it could be lifted up into eternity. And I think that we, we realize that on some level. And pain, more often than not, is really the actuating thing that gets us to realize that. It's unfortunately when we confront loss, when we realize like this is not what the world is meant to be. When you stand at the grave and you look down at this dark pit like in the mud and the dirt, like that's, that's the image of God. And the image of God is not meant to be buried like that. And sometimes, it, it, a lot of times, unfortunately, it takes, that, it takes that pain to bring us to our knees, to make us realize that the world truly is good. And it's not meant for that. Um, it's coming to terms with like the deep problems, like the existential things that we struggle with, uh, that really kind of push us towards God in a very real and meaningful way. Um, you know, maybe this is the reason why excessive wealth can be a dangerous thing. Because when we're comfortable, humility goes away. We feel like we are in control. We feel like, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the parable of the, uh, the man in his barns, right? Everything's under control. I'm going to knock down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones because I've got my wealth and I've got my food and I've got everything that I need. I'm in control. I will plan for tomorrow. But we realize, unfortunately, that that's not quite the case. Pain makes us humble. Pain makes us realize what's wrong with the world. And what's right with the world is the creator. What's right about the world is the, is the one who brought the world into being from nothing and the one who sustains it and the one who really transforms and lifts it up into what it was meant to be in the first place. So my particular road to faith goes straight through the tomb of my father in the way that I think our resurrection goes straight through the cross. All of us have our own particular crosses. All of us have our own tombs that we walk through and rest in, right? Christ was in the tomb for three days. It's a, it's a long, and it's a lonely, and it's a difficult three days, but there he was. And I think we all, we all do that at some point. Um, it's part of the process. Pain, for whatever reason, seems to be part of the process. The darkness, for whatever reason, seems to be part of the process. It orients us in some sort of way. It reminds us of our need for the light and the need for the one who gives us the light. So I think that's pretty universal. At least I think so, anyway. Number one, that, that, so that's an important thing in my particular journey. Um, number two, uh, the consequences 
of Christ's victory in the lives of other people. Um, so again, my, my faith, at least my faith as it's kind of developed in the course of the last decade or so, isn't really sustained by theoretical things, even though I tend to be a very abstract person and a very philosophical person. Uh, like when it comes to things that I've read in the patrist patristic corpus about, you know, you, have, you can have arguments and you can have debates and so forth. For me, one of the most powerful examples of a, of a church father, like talking about why why we know that God is, right? Why we know that the Son of God was incarnate and resurrected is found in, in a really important little book called On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, who was a, you know, an important church father uh, in the early centuries of the church. He wrote it when he was 19 years old. Um, so think about what you did when you were 19. <laughs> How many like classics of theology that you wrote when you were 19, right? Um, but he, he, has this, he has this line uh, later on in the book where he talks about faith and he says, you know, I know that God is real because I look in the gutters, I'm paraphrasing here, I look in the gutters and I see Christians. I see the men and women of Christ, the men and women of the church, kneeling in the gutter with those who are suffering and in pain and in poverty. Like, that's how I know Christ is real. I know Christ is real because I go to the Colosseum and I see Christians on their way to their death singing hymns of praise to the Lord. That's how I know that God is real. I know that God is real because I see the incredible way that he's actually transformed people, and I see the way that people live in him. So forget the cosmological arguments, forget about arguments about the prime mover and whatever other sort of philosophical things, right? I see God is real because I actually see his image in the people who are around me. And I think that's really powerful for, for me too because I'm here also in many ways because of the faith of my grandmothers, for instance. Because when they were, when, when I was younger, they made sure that I said that I did my cross before I ate my meal. Um, because they would take me to church when I was younger. Because when I got older and I saw them towards the end of their lives, no matter how much they're, how sick they were, no matter how, how much they were in pain, no matter how difficult their age and their sickness was, every time I would ask them, how are you doing? The answer would always be glory to God. It hurts, but glory to God. How are you? You know, yeah, today's a rough day, but glory to God. Like there was this incredible resurrectional hope, even in the midst of this pain. I mean, they were on their cross in a very real sort of way. Both of my grandmothers had kind of difficult ends, but there were no complaints. There was no self-pity. There was, they, they were glorifying God at a time when somebody like me would just be complaining and railing, like, why has God given me this sickness? Why, why has God forsaken me? They realized that he didn't, and they glorified him even then, when somebody weak like me would have complained. Like, that's powerful. It's powerful to see the way that, um, you know, my grandfathers worked to sustain their families. Incredible self-sacrificial love. It wasn't necessarily pious in kind of like an overt sort of sense. They weren't necessarily church-going men. But the fact that they worked 15 hours a day for their families, the fact that they never did anything for themselves, that's the love of Christ in a very real sort of way. God transforms people, and it's, it's seeing that transformation that really has sustained me. But it's also really challenged me too, right? Because... I'll never forget, um, there, Gandhi said something very interesting. Um, it, might be, uh, it might be apocryphal, I'm not sure, but it's powerful nonetheless. Um, he was talking one time about the Christians that he knew when he was younger. And somebody asked him, like, you know, would you ever consider converting to Christianity? And he said, you know, Christianity seems wonderful. That, that Jesus guy sounds fantastic. I can't do it, though, because of all the Christians that I've met. Most of the Christians that he met were terribly racist and awful to him. You know, he grew up in a colony. He was not treated very well for most of his life by God-fearing Christians. Um, so in the same way that we can make God manifest to people, we can totally push him away. So that's kind of the risk, I guess, that goes with that factor. We can make faith real for people, or we can totally undermine it. And that's kind of on us. So that's a terrifying like, side effect of that. Um, and number three, um, I, kinda, I, just, 
the, the older I get, the more I see the consequences of Christ's work in my own life. Um, you know, again, forgetting the books, forgetting all that other sort of stuff. Like, the more time goes on, the more I just have to acknowledge my own brokenness. You know, like especially being married now. I've been married now for two years, and uh, one of the, the wonderful things about being married is that it's very revelatory. You know, very revelatory. Like, I thought I was a really peaceful and patient and wonderful person when I got married. No, I have, I'm, like a, I'm a really not a nice guy. I have a terrible temper. I'm terribly self-centered. Like, all these sort of broken things about me are now manifest because there's another person in my life that is there, and suddenly, oh, that's a selfish desire that I normally have. I normally think about what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, etc. Or the times that like, I just kind of want to try to sit in peace and try to sit in silence and put myself in a prayerful sort of state, the bizarre sorts of thoughts and feelings and emotions that run through my head and my heart, like crazy and sometimes really scary things, to be blunt. <laughs> There's a lot of brokenness in there. Um, the more that I come to terms with my own brokenness, the more that I acknowledge it, the more that I realize that I am not the center of my universe, um, the more that I realize like I am not a whole integrated being. I'm kind of shards of glass that are all just mixed up together, shards of glass that are just bumping up against each other and sort of cutting me. Um, the more I contrast that with the peace of the saints, with the peace that I have felt being around saintly people, um, with the moments of wholeness, which I know have come to me through Christ, like the actual stillness, the actual joy, the actual humanness, like my most human moments come in my connection to the most human one of all, the God-man himself. Um, and again, that's not a theoretical thing. It's a very lived experiential thing. Uh, it's nothing that I could have argued myself to. It's just something that a twisty, turvy life have, has caused me to realize. And so it's, it's, it's those sorts of things that we can talk about on some level, but the more beautiful thing to do is simply to say, come and see. All right, let me, let me sort of share my own experience with you and allow you to hopefully experience it for yourself. So that's kind of why I'm here. Um, those are my, I guess those are the three basic reasons why I'm here, why I continue to be a Christian, why I work for the church, why I, why I talk about God and my faith. Um, so that's that. I don't know. I yield to questions if anybody has any, any thoughts or questions. Yeah. So the, the question was, for microphone purposes, um, after I graduated seminary, did I have kind of a choice, or you know, was it was ordained ministry on the table versus that? Yeah, um, th this is again one of the very interesting things that I've that I've learned in my life that I have made plans, and my plans, which are always very like thought out, and I do the sort of pros and cons, right, and I think about everything very. All of my my plans are terrible in retrospect, <laughs> and God always has something better. Um, which again is an experiential sort of thing that I'm just kind of coming to realize. Like I went to seminary originally thinking that um, I was going to go to a monastery one day and become a monk, or at least it was a strong, strong feeling that I had. Um, didn't end up happening. I love. I mean, I still have a very uh, strong attachment to monasteries and the monastic life. Like I went to Mount Athos eight times from the time I graduated law school through a seminary. <laughs> Eight times, yeah, and like each time, it was it always it always hurt coming back. Great, uh, <laughs> no, I, I loved it, and and I, I found like one of two monasteries that I was thinking in my head, like maybe I'll end up here, um, but no, I, I mean it wasn't for me, it wasn't for me, uh, and I think maybe maybe the only reason that that happened because I feel like sometimes we understand things better in, things better in retrospect, you know, like there, there's a reason why the Gospel according to Saint John is the most theologically developed. Because like he stands in a different perspective and he looks at the cross in light of the resurrection, right? He kind of looks backwards. And I kind of think now maybe the only reason I had this monastic 
flirtation, for lack of a better word, was because it eased my family's transition to seminary. Because originally they were terrified that I was going to be a monk and you know not get married and all that sort of stuff. And then eventually I said, you know, maybe this marriage thing really is for me after all. And it's like, oh good, okay, good, 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 do the priest thing, whatever you want, but you're gonna get married, right? So who knows, maybe that just greased the wheels for my family to accept this, like, who knows, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I thought that then for a long time as I was uh, in seminary, I thought that I would go and I'd get ordained and uh, I'd work at a parish somewhere, but it's not what happened. And to be blunt, I don't feel called to that at least now in this particular moment. Um, I feel called to lay ministry. Um, I, I feel called to uh, encourage people to understand their faith as a seven days a week thing. Um, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the difficulties that we seem to, faith, uh, to face as Orthodox Christians in particular is that we don't really have a well-developed sense of vocation and we don't really have a well-developed sense of what it means to be in the church. So like stereotypically, if there's a young man who seems like he's interested in church, the first instinct is to say, you should go to seminary and be a priest. And if there's a young woman who seems interested in the faith, we say, you should go to seminary and find a priest to marry, right? Or find a seminarian to marry. Like we have a very narrow understanding of what it means to be a pious Orthodox Christian. Like we have difficulty sort of thinking like, hey, you love God, but you also love science? Like go and be a faithful biologist. We don't really have a model for understanding that. Like, you love God and you love art, go and be a faithful artist. You know, walk your particular path and glorify God in whatever it is that you do. You don't need to be ordained if you're a, a man. You don't need to be the wife of a priest if you're a woman. But for whatever reason, like, we just, we have a very narrow sort of sense of vocation. So, I don't know, I feel, I feel called to, to challenge that in a sense and to get people to realize, like, you're not an Orthodox Christian only on Sunday mornings and we're all Orthodox Christians in our own particular way. It's just about glorifying God according, like in the path that he's given for us. Um, so that's kind of what I feel called to do for now anyway. Or who knows? Who knows? Who knows five years from now, 10 years from now, five minutes from now? Who knows, right? So you, you married your wife you were in seminary? No, uh, so I got married um, after graduation. I met my wife while I was at school, but uh, got married after graduation. After graduating seminary, yeah, yeah. So again, to pull Saint Athanasios um, out at us because he's just fantastic. He, at one point, I think it's on in the on in the on in the, on the, in on the incarnation again. He talks about all sin is essentially idolatrous, on some level. It's all idolatry, right? It's all it's all it's taking God out of His rightful place at the center of everything and putting something else, um, and then kind of worshiping that, whatever it might be. I crafted, I think, the way that I see it in retrospect now is I crafted a particular vision of myself which had nothing to do with who I actually am, which had nothing to do with my connection with God. It was an idolatrous sort of vision of myself. It was me crafting my own plan rather than allowing myself to be open to the reason that I'm here. And I think that's probably in retrospect one of the reasons why it was so unfulfilling because it was, it was me trying to impose my vision of myself upon myself, you know? To try to make myself in my own mind's image rather than allow myself to be cultivated as being in the image and likeness of God. Um, so yeah, the law, law wasn't for me. And it's something I, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad I'm done with it to be totally blunt. No, but no offense, there are people who are called to be lawyers and there are people who are called to be faithful lawyers. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with people who are scientists. Nothing wrong with people who are whatever, like, you know. I, financial law. Financial stuff, yeah, yeah. It was interesting, but again, terribly unfulfilling, yeah. So the question was, you know, a small parish trying to reach out to the wider community and also trying to care for, the, for young people. Um, I think those are, those are two related questions, as all these things ultimately are, are related on some level. Um, because I think that, you know, I'll, I'll start with the second part about young people and raising and raising young people in the church. Um, you know, because there there are there are there are three basic factors I think that are really important when it comes to young people and whether they stick with the church over time. Um, one is you know the faith of their parents, obviously, because all youth ministry really starts in the home. Um, if we outsource our youth ministry to our parish, it's not going to work. Um, Second is 
role models who are outside of the family, um, which is why it's great for young people to have camp counselors and sort of you know pious Sunday school teachers and all of that, um, especially people at a at a, at an older age than they are. Um, like it's very destructive, just terribly destructive when you have a, a parish that is. Um, like full of really, really young people and really, really old people. Um, because like as a, as a young person, if you're like a 10 year old kid and you don't see anybody in their teens or 20s or 30s in the church, then how are you going to see yourself standing in the pew at that age, right? So it's kind of, you, you need somebody at that next stage of life. Somebody also who's connected in, you know, not by blood, I think it's important. And third is some sort of religious experience. Um, because again, the faith has to be real, right? Um, so those are the really important factors when it comes to the, the life of the uh, the life of a young person growing in Christ, um, and and outreach I feel like is such an important part of that because, you know, as 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 a young person when you look and you see that the faith matters enough to the adults in your life to spread, that really changes your um, perception of the faith. Um, it, it, I think it's it's one of the things that we as American Orthodox in particular have to wrestle with because we're still kind of like figuring out our place as ethnic churches and you know we, we, we as Orthodox in particular have a lot of that kind of ethnic baggage that we deal with um, you know the, the, the ethnic ties really kept people in the church for a long period of time uh, but are now kind of a thing that's alienating a lot of people uh, maybe it's kind of overstated its welcome right um, so like I because I, I grew up in a very ethnic parish and it, it always kind of like it undermines the universality of the gospel when none of us are terribly, when none of the adults, right, none of the people are interested in spreading it in any sort of universal way. So I feel like you can't, you probably can't have successful ministry to young people without that if you're not actually modeling an evangelical, genuinely Christian sort of sensibility. Um, and then specifically how you do that outreach, well again, that, I mean, that kind of becomes a little bit of a practical question, how you do it exactly. Um, on a, on a basic sort of level, it's just being hospitable. It's, it's, it's inviting people to come and see. Um, like n big parishes, little, par little parishes, no matter how many resources we have, we can all kind of invite people in. Um, and that, again, is not, a very, not an institutional sort of thing. That's hopefully all of us as Christians believe in this enough to extend an invitation to those we care about. Um, and if we don't, right? Like, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? God is, God is not real. The church is not real if, if, if it's not that important for us. You know, we talk about our sports teams. We talk about politics. We invite people to support our candidate. We invite people to support our sports team. We invite people to try our favorite cola. You know, we don't invite people to come and experience the kingdom with us. Like, the kingdom is not real in the way that our favorite soft drink is. And that's tragic. Uh, a friend of mine who's the, the Youth and Young Adult Ministries Director for the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, he, he's very fond of saying, you know, you don't get argued into the church. You get loved into the church. It's kind of like the point that we said before. It's, you know, the, the church di has won converts in the past because of our apologetics and because of the sermons and all that. But the church has also won converts because like, during the Roman Empire, in moments of plague, the pagans fled the cities. It was the Christians who stuck around and took care of people. And then when the sick got well again, they realized, oh, it's these Jesus people who stuck around and cared for me. <laughs> they loved me in a way that nobody else ever did. Maybe there's something to this. And that's how people have gotten loved into the church. I mean, we're stereotypically, like, you know, Orthodoxy is, if, to the extent that orthodoxy is a well-kept secret, as people sometimes say, it's because we're not loving enough. It's really what it boils down to. Like, we have hard hearts. If our hearts were a little bit softer and a little bit more loving, we wouldn't be as unknown as we are. That's on us. You know, I, I think that the, the best, like this is kind of a, a really nice example of being the bee, right? Of kind of finding the good in, in situations. There was, a, there was a child one time that was sort of like, I mean, not screaming at the top of, I forget, his or her lungs, just kind of like babbling and whatever during the course of the service. And some of the people in the area began getting grumpy and were shushing and so forth. And the, the, the priest at one point, I think it was like during his sermon, 
the child started babbling and they were shushing the, the kid and the priest was just like, look, the, the, the child doesn't have words. The child is sort of praying with us to the extent that the, ch the child can pray. It's, 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 it's his particular way of chanting and his particular way of offering his voice to God. It's a beautiful thing. Don't, don't shush the baby. Let him pray. And like people kind of got shamed by that. And just, I thought it was, an, it, was a, it was a nice way of realizing like kids are kids. They babble sometimes. Especially Yeah. He like makes his little noise not really loud. They're like, oh, he sounds like he's hit the same same tone as the chanter. Right? It's sort of, and it's, he actually sort of blends in a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. Like if you're, if, you're, if you're on Broadway and you're watching a play, fine, we're all there to be sort of quiet, but I don't know, like, because there, there, there are people who get upset sometimes when, when, when people congregationally sing too. It's the same sort of thing, like, I don't, I don't know why, why, why we're, so, we're so uptight about people participating, <laughs> you know, in their own ways. Because again, our faith has to be active, right? Like, sing if you're going to sing, say amen loudly, like, if you're a child, you know, babble, offer your prayer to God too. I don't know. Don't be afraid of the chaos. Like, again, just go go, go and, re and read some of the accounts of what what Hagia Sophia was like with all the bishops and the presbyters and the deacons and this sea of thousands upon thousands of people. Like, <laughs> it's, I, I, I would I would love for some of us to be able to go back in time and see how chaotic and overwhelming some of that worship was. Definitely not tidy, and definitely not the way that we sometimes think of worship as being. Way more active. Way more. The Pope did not. Did I don't know. Same thing. I mean, yeah. you had like 10,000 people at a mass. Yeah. <laughs> it's not tidy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, our lives aren't tidy, mm -hmm. I guess. I don't, I don't know. Not, not to overstate, like, chaos either, but uh, I don't know. There, I, I feel like there's something, there's something beautiful about stepping into a parish. You know, like, like you're there for Vespers, and somebody's kind of like, some, when somebody needs it, they go and they step to the corner, and they've got a few minutes talking to a saint in front of the icon. And I don't know, there's, 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 a, there's a, I feel like there's a life to that sometimes, as opposed to everybody sitting with their arms folded, kind of like waiting for the performance to end. It's not what it is. So the, the question was, how did the faith of my grandmothers become my faith? I think there's, there's, there's two answers to that. One, um, on a kind of more mystical level, like I, I genuinely believe that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the, just the prayers and the love of my grandmothers. Um, uh, you know, I think they're, they, all the years that they spent praying for me, all the prayers that they are doing right now, right, in their particular state, waiting for the kingdom, right, experiencing a, a foretaste of it, like that, 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 that affects me on some level. Um, that genuine connection that they had with God, which kind of in a mystical sense brought me in. Um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more kind of practical level, though, too, it was, it was modeling. Um, I think that the fact that it was, it was an important thing in their lives, it was something that I saw very constantly because their, theirs was not an intellectual faith. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my grandmothers, uh, later in life when she was ill, uh, she wasn't able to get to church as much as she would like, so she would watch services on TV and they'd, you know, they'd stream them in from parishes here or Greece or whatever it might be. And she was watching, like very early in this process, she was watching um, after the consecration of the gifts, there was like a, a camera in the altar and the priest was communing. And you know, if, you, if you've ever sort of like looked in an altar the way that a priest receives communion, he'll receive the body first, then he'll receive the chalice. And she was very confused when she saw that. And the next time she saw me, she asked me, he's like, why did the priest take andidero, like the blessed bread? Why did he do that before he received communion? And I said, what do you mean? Like, that's, that's something that we take afterwards. Like, well, I was watching the liturgy and he ate the bread first. Like, why did he take the blessed bread before he received communion? And this is like a super pious, never missed a service in 90 years woman. But like, no one ever explained to her the mechanics of the liturgy in, in, a, in a very substantive sort of, sort of way. So like in, in, in a sort of catechetical sense, not a developed faith, but again, she always had her little prayer book next to her. When she wasn't watching the Greek news, she had this little prayer book that she would flip through. You know, always, pray, always thankful before meals, always just kind of gentle and pious and loving, always talking about God, always thanking God, always giving glory to God. Um, seeing that it was important to her made, it, made a difference in my life. She would never have been able to like, explain theology in any sort of like, intellectual kind of sense, 
But that's fine. I, I went later and I, I read the books. But the reason that I went later and read the books was because, you know, she, she helped teach me that it was alive. Um, and that's the thing. She, she never, like, she never forced me in any particular way. Sometimes I think when it comes to kids, we worry about, like, making sure that the kids are doing something, like, and getting angry with them, possibly, if they don't. Um, she never, like, made me say my prayers or, or made me do anything along those lines. She always did it. And it was always a part of her life. And uh, that, I don't know, that, that's, that was always there. I went through my doubts. I went through my twists and turns. But like, that foundation was always there. She, did, like, she didn't need to tell me to be a faithful Christian. She showed me what it was to be a faithful Christian. Um, and, that, and, that, and that demands, I think, a certain sort of level of, of trust, right? Like, kind of step back. Kids will make their mistakes. I'll be praying for you the entire time. You'll see me saying my prayers. You'll, you'll see who I am as a Christian and a, and, and, and a faithful person. And who knows what the future brings. I don't know. There, there's, a, there's a certain quiet confidence in that. Um, you know, never get angry if I, if I wasn't at church. She was always at church. You know, I knew that. But, but it was never like, it was never a thing that I was forced to do. Uh, which I think is also really important. Like church was always something that she got to do and always really looked forward to. Uh, and I, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful that I don't have kind of those negative experiences of feeling over, especially as I got older, of kind of being dragged to church, which can, for a lot of kids, can have like a really kind of like a, a negative association with it. Like this is a punishment almost that I have to endure on a Sunday morning. So, um, I don't know, modeling, genuine modeling. On some level, when a kid is young enough, like clearly you, you make the kid, the kid doesn't want to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. Like, no, you make the kid wash their hands. Like, it's good for them. The kid doesn't want to eat their vegetables. No, you make the kid eat their vegetables, right? But at, at, at some point, the, in the process of growing up is we sort of, you know, we're, we, we kind of seed kids the ability to make their own choices. Um, and it's a risk, right, on some level. Like, it, it's, it's kind of like, it's a process of letting go, I think, the, the, the transition of a child going from somebody who is an infant doing everything that you say because you're the parent to so, sort of being able to make these own decisions on their own. And like, a lot of those decisions will be wrong, right? Or at least some of those decisions will be wrong. So I, I don't know how, I, I, I can't say specifically how to navigate that transition, but I feel like that is the transition. Um, and, 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 and that sort of like, gradual transformation into adulthood um, is, is just kind of a necessary thing for, for us and is just kind of a necessary part of the, of the curve. Um, you know, because if, if the faith is ever going to matter for us as adults, it's something that we have to freely choose. Um, if, if it, because like, I, I, have, I have friends who um, just spent way too much time arguing with their parents about doing this on Sunday morning. And like literally, like I have friends who when they were in college even, like in their like very late teens, early 20s, who would have like their parents having these shouting matches or whatever with them. Like that's not constructive on some level. You know, it's just, it's, just, it's not constructive on some level. Go to church and, and pray for your child. Don't spend half an hour in the morning getting all worked up, arguing with your 21 year old child, and then go to church in a flustered sort of state. The kid's still gonna be home, and you're not going to have the peace that you need to actually like offer yourself at the liturgy. But I, I don't know. Like, in, in, I can't really get more particular than that because I don't know. It's just God bless. How do I explain my orthodoxy? Like, what, what's my elevator speech kind of thing? I just I, 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 I wonder. Just it's hard sometimes to explain it in like two minutes or less. Yeah, um, that that's also hard to do because. Um, Different people probably need different things. Um, so I think it's always, it's always good to gauge who the audience is because like, if, you're, if you're talking to somebody who's not a Christian, they're probably going to need something different than somebody who is a Christian or a particular kind of Christian or whatever. So it, it's hard to say, but in, in particular, I'll just say, orth, well, what's orthodoxy? Um, I mean, orthodoxy is the church. Um, orthodoxy is uh, something that we can, you know, trace all the way back to Christ and trace all the way back to the Old Testament. Um, it's the it's the it's the living body of Christ, um, and it's something that uh, I don't know. If you're interested, maybe I can tell you where your local church is. Something along those lines. Because again, how how do you how do you express something 
you, you, you can sort of say something, but I think it's also kind of important to open the door to the person experiencing it too. Um, you know, because that's, what, that's what's really going to do it justice, uh, inviting them to liturgy, right? Like if you're curious enough to ask me about it, maybe you're curious enough to come and see. Maybe. If not, we're still cool. Don't worry about it. How, so the, the question was, how do you navigate this, this kind of tension, for lack of a better word, between on the one hand, come and see, but on the other hand, go and, and, and spread the word? Um, yeah, it needs to be both. It definitely needs to be both, because it, 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 it can be, complacency, I think, is the perfect word, right? Like, we, like there could be this, this over sort of confidence that we have the truth, and we will sort of sit here on our throne and wait for people to come. Um, but on the other hand, like, what exactly does that outreach look like? It depends, probably different things in different places. I think at the very least, at the very least, each and every one of our parishes, you know, anywhere and everywhere, you know, th this is something in particular that Orthodox churches like struggle with because the, for the most part, it seems like Orthodox churches are known in their neighborhoods for their food festivals, right? For their cultural festivals. Like, you, you know, the, the, the Greek church down the block, they have really good baklava. Like, I love their festival because of the souvlaki. Or the Arab church, like, they have really good, you know, falafel. That's why I love that, like, their festival. Um, every church needs to have a, a loving presence in the community. And it may not be, like, an, an explicitly evangelical in, like, the preaching sort of sense. But, um, you know, one of the ways that we're sort of thinking about it in the Archdiocese is really making it a cornerstone of young adult ministry in particular. Um, because it's something that, just because of our generation, like young adults in particular, are very drawn to causes and are very drawn to action. And I think our, you know, our, our, our communities should be known for the work that we do with the disadvantaged and with the struggling in their particular areas. Um, and and as, as we're sort of thinking about it internally, it probably it just it seems to make sense to get like the dynamism and the sort of optimism of 20 year olds and 30 year olds to really be kind of the, the spearhead of that for particular communities. Um, depending on the resources of the parish, depending on the people who are at the parish, um, like we're thinking even of doing programs for like outreach weekends, um, ma like making kind of programs to have the, the doors of the church open, people there to maybe explain the faith in a little bit more of a developed sort of way. But at the very least, like, we should be taking the love of Christ to people in the form of coats in the winter, in the form of food, in the form of things like that. So again, people will, people will know us at the, at the very least, at the very least, even if no one decides to come and visit the church, they'll know, like, hey, those Christians, like, they really love people, you know? I've read Jesus loves people, but I've seen that they love people. And then you see, like, God knows. If, if, it, if, it, never, if it doesn't result in any people converting, doesn't matter. It's, a, it's, not about, it's, it's not about numbers, right? Like we're not, we're not out there to uh, increase our roles. We're not there to increase stewardship from a financial point of view. Um, we can't judge the success of our ministry based on rosters, right? Because we're not just a club. Um, we, we, just, we, we, we base or we sort of judge what we do in the light of Christ. Um, and that's it. Whatever, whatever sort of fruit it, it, it develops. Because the fruit eventually will be eternal life in the kingdom. Even in a more institutional sense, like I was talking to a friend of mine who's a clergyman, and they're developing kind of an outreach committee at their parish. And, and, and his thought, which I think is so just delightfully obvious, is to sort of set the goals of the outreach com committee with the injunction of Christ. Like just say, okay, like, you know, I was hungry and you gave me food. Okay, that's one thing that we should be doing. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. That's another thing that we should be doing. And they're kind of using that as a model for the sort of outreach that they're doing. And they're like, it, you know, they're, they're doing it in a very creative sort of way. So like, uh, it's, you know, he's like, they, he, was, he, was, he was telling me about it the other day that uh, like I was, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. They're using that um, as kind of their model for college ministry, which is sort of a play on, you know, obviously alcohol consumption in college. Um, so, like, you know, what sort of drink are you giving to these young people who are otherwise, you know, drinking in an unhealthy sort of way? So, it, it, in, in some ways, it doesn't even need to be like a, in a literal sort of sense of the word. Um, but, but, you know, it, you know, it's because it's like, like hunger. There's, there's physical hunger and there's emotional hunger. It's like there's, there's a lot we can do with the, but if we at the very least set that up as goals, which it seems like Christ sets that up for us as goals too. Like, remind ourselves of that and then judge what we do in light of what he said we should do.
Simple. Hard to do, but simple to say. Yeah? Um, in, the, um, in the Ten Commandments, it says, love your enemies. So how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you love your enemies? So this, I think, is a really interesting uh, psychological question. Um, how do you love your enemies? That's the goal, I feel like. The question is, like, yeah, what, what do you do to get to that goal? And I think an interesting thing about uh, human psychology seems to be that, uh, you know, and we forget this sometimes, there's a, there's a link between the outside and the inside, which is like the reason that we fast, too, because like the, the, we do things to our body because of the effect that it has internally. So it, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast about this, and um, they brought up uh, Ben Franklin. And uh, Ben Franklin had a problem with a fellow lawmaker of the day. This guy really, really hated Ben Franklin. And he's like, how can I win this guy over to my side? Uh, he, he asked to borrow a book from this guy who hated him and would like get up and give speeches talking about how terrible Ben Franklin was. He was an egoist and he was terrible for the country, yada, yada. So he asked this guy for a book. And the guy gave him a book, like one of his rare collection of books. And he never said a bad word about him in public ever again. The, the reason seems to be that, again, the, our outward actions shape our interactions. If we do something kind for a person, it will shape the emotions and the sort of inner reality that we have about a person. So like, this is the reason why the church says, like, go out there and feed the hungry. You may look down on the homeless and you may think that they're dirty and this and that, and you may have a lot of judgmental sort of thoughts. Those will change when you go through the physical act of helping somebody. Um, you may have a lot of like really angry thoughts about somebody as an enemy. Do something nice for them even if you don't want to. And like eventually your heart will soften because there's a, there's a connection between your body and your heart. So like it, you're not going to like don't wait to love your enemies before you do something for them. Do something for them so you will love your enemies. Um, and and it's, it's even like the, re, the, the we sometimes talk about this in terms of the praying tradition of the church. Like we don't pray because we're a prayerful people, we pray so that we will become a prayerful people. Um, we, 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 we pray so many times and we say, Lord, have mercy on the outside so many times so that we can cultivate inside a sense of asking God for mercy. You know, but it's, it's, it, usually it's not going to happen on the inside first. So what do you do with your enemies? Do nice things for them. Even if you don't want to, especially if you don't want to. And, 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 that, and that's the sort of thing that will, will soften yourself. Like, do. Sometimes do. There's um, some of the best advice that I ever heard. One of my professors, um, his spiritual father is like, I think, a, a monk or a bishop in Russia, I forget. And the advice that he gave him, which he passed on to us in class one day, is um, anytime you have a good thought, act on that thought. Um, take advantage of the moments when you have some sort of good instinct. Don't allow yourself to get convinced out of it. Just go and do. So like, you're going to do something nice for this person, do it. Because if somebody is our enemy, if we do have bad feelings about somebody, we can very easily convince ourselves out of doing something. Just in a very Yoda sense of the word. There's no try, only do. Go, do. You know? <laughs> and then eventually you will, on the inside, feel that as well. You'll, you'll, you'll transform on the inside. Again, hard, harder to say than to do, but try. Anyway, God bless. What do you feel as the internet sensation that you are? Do you get a lot of, like, I mean, how, how has that changed your world? Do you get a lot of people knowing you, like, at least in New York or in Boston? So this, this, is, this, is, this is fantastic. The question was, how do you feel as an internet sensation, right? Here's the, here's the, here's the great thing. Nothing has changed. Because I have a friend of mine who's, um, um, have you ever listened to the Raising Saints podcast on Asian Faith Radio? Elisa Bialtich. Uh, it's an awesome podcast. She's a Sunday school director at her parish, and she talks a lot about just kind of raising kids in the church. I highly recommend it. Great podcast. And one of her friends was talking to her one time. She's like, you know, what is it, what is it like to be Orthodox famous? Uh, that people know you in your podcast, and she came out with a book. And Elisa sort of very dryly looked at her and said, I'm Orthodox famous, which is to say, I am not famous. <laughs> so, 
so, so there you go. <laughs> Not at all. I like I've I've gotten recognized like by one old lady at church one time, and that was really it. And I'm fine with that. Honestly, I'm totally fine with that. Because uh, that's I, I I have I have such an inflated sense of self that if I did get recognized more, it would be terrible for my spirituality. So like I'm glad that I don't. Um, so yeah, that's all. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you.